This poem is not for you. You can't wear it on your forehead. It won't look good in your profile picture, and I know you wish it was more colorful already. I'm sorry, but this poem is not for you. Not like the last one, which wasn't for you either, but you told me it was no good, told me to stop speaking it, told me you'd hurt me if I didn't, then took it behind my back, didn't you? Told your friends how you wrote it. Well, this poem is not for you. I remembered not to write it down this time, though you're no novice to sealing thoughts themselves. Remember that time you flashing like siren whipped down my door, cut out my tongue and told me yours was better. Yeah. I never found where the old one went, so now my grandma can't always understand. And my God, I wish I could write poems for her instead of you. My God, in a different language, midi Allah. Do you remember the boys from school? How you tell me their art was mud dark pretension way below a sea. And the girls in the changing rooms, you'd say, poems are for the empty legs and tanned, not brown shoulder blades. Well, this poem is not for you. And it isn't for your sister either, actually, because we're not. Despite you telling me how similar we are, every time I see her, she looks straight through me. And she told me as well, you know, how they used to laugh. Your sisters with the now pierced noses told her, only animals do that. And she'll never forget that time you left us by the water's edge. Her hands were full of it. And you said, drink, work hard, goodbye. So we tried to, but my God, the salt. And we only had our hands, didn't we? Only had our hands. Tell me, could you hear our shouts by then? My mother was screaming, go back where you came from. But there was no rebooming of the sea. So we're here now where I'm telling you this poem is not for you. But the number of times I've said that makes me doubt it. And if it is for you, then at least let me tell you, don't you dare file it away someplace. Don't you dare blink nod it into the race drawer or mm, scrunch eye it into the colonialism cupboard. Don't token applaud it into the feminism lever arch. I can see you're doing it now. This poem is beyond you. It will never sit on your skin the way my colour sits on mine. You will never find it fallen down the floorboards after five years. You will never study it at GCSE. And most of all, you will never feel it pass between you and a stranger in a way that says, I understand. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I'm Sahima Mansal Khan. I write words and I speak words. You can find me online at thebrownhijabi.com or on Twitter at thebrownhijabi. So, as you can tell from that poem, I write quite a bit about writing and about performing and what that experience is like for me. And that's because to me, it's not a neutral space to be in, it's always political. And that's because it's not just about me, it's about your, you as an audience, you know, your consumption, your demand, your enjoyment. As a visibly Muslim woman, I appear on this stage in a context where there are many narratives and images that you immediately associate with me when you see me up here. And that makes it difficult for me to speak. It makes it difficult for me to know how to talk without falling into certain tropes, without responding, only responding, and not being able to just exist complexly and mundanely. It also means that when I speak, um, as with people from all sorts of marginalized groups, our experiences are expected to represent, right? So that you might go home today and say, oh, Oh, I know something about Muslim women when really you know something about me so there is a history to this and I think that's that's important to recognize um, this obsession or this kind of curiosity with Muslim women and you have to remember the French and the British went into North Africa and the, the Indian subcontinent um, when when they colonized and in those places there was this real fascination with Muslim women because you couldn't necessarily access them right they were in spaces often with only other women or they were covered and so the colonial male gaze couldn't couldn't access and that was frustrating and that created this obsession it was the same time as science was being done in a way that said only what is observable is what is knowable. So, you know, we turn away from magic, we turn away from superstition because we, we observe facts and therefore we know them. How do you know or control the colonial subject who will not be seen, who will not be accessed, right? This was the predicament. And so you get the obsession kind of stemming from there, and then you see it fast forward to 2001. We invade Afghanistan to, because of our, we, well, one of the reasons being we will save Muslim women from Muslim men, right? We will liberate them, we will unveil them. Again, fast forward to 2016, um, Marseille and Nice, the Burkini ban, we will tell women, you, you cannot cover up, we will uncover you, and this will be part of your liberation. So often it's also kind of coded as saving and liberating. 
I think it's important to situate myself in that context, to situate all ourselves in that context, that you come here today and I perform here today in a context where there is a real desire to know what Muslim women think. What do we feel? What do we really think? Why do we really wear it? Who are we really oppressed by? And so I find it confusing sometimes and I find it difficult to speak. And uh, this next poem is about that. I learnt white was the most important audience long before I learnt how to perform. Learnt how to answer your burning questions weeks before they left your mouths. And I answered the whys and how to justify before the questions... I practiced the why and how to justify before I was practiced with the folds. I learnt to shrink in, misread the holy word. My brother got used to a name that wasn't his and my mother built a good nice house. We cultivated quiet voices in the hopes we could be less than interesting and maybe just a little bit more but you can't build your home on a stage because the nuances you think belong to you will be noted as traits of them all and a standing ovation in that crowded place is merely a slap to the jaw a reminder that you lost your language real good you learned just the right facts and said just not enough you cannot find safety between curtain falls and oppression won't end with applause the show doesn't end it really goes on even if your interest does not so if you only watch when your interest is peaked, then no wonder you won't understand. And if you only hear the parts of the script that you know, no wonder my words make no sense. I am always and never a Muslim woman. I am always and never authentic. I learned to grow big, reread the holy word, and we cultivated louder voices. I no longer hope will be less than interesting, but I know we are so, so much more. Thank you. Um, having said all that, I do perform and I do talk and I do think there is value in doing that because I believe that the way you change the world is that you change the way think, people think about the world. So if I can be here today and I can have conversations with people and people feel provoked or they feel perhaps that something they had believed to be true or that they had not questioned the truth of is perhaps not true, then that's valuable to me. And I think it's particularly valuable at a time where there's a real emphasis, I think, put on people kind of feeling and believing that we are good people. I'm a good person, you know, I buy ethically, I retweet the right content, I go to the right shows, I wear the right clothes, all that kind of thing. And what I've been thinking about recently, because it's come up in my own friendships with people, is that there seems to be an emphasis on professing belief rather than acting on it. So you get this situation where people will read the right things, but when it comes down to it, they won't necessarily see you in your fullness and humanize you in your fullness. Something that I'm really passionate about, really interested in, is the imagination is the, the way that we imagine Muslims in this country. Um, it's been my research interest, like I say, for the last year. And I think what I find fascinating is that the obsession with the Muslim, so the terrorist, the Muslim woman, the Muslim criminal man, the Muslim patriarch, the Muslim, let's just call it the Muslim. The obsession with these figures uh, actually works really cleverly to distract us from any socio-economic or political problems in this country. And it works in such a crude and rudimentary way that I'm often surprised. I think people are increasingly understanding that. Um, so let's take, for example, terrorism, right? So the way we understand terrorism is that it happens when normal Muslims become radical. So if something inside Muslims happens and they become terrorists. So that understanding places the, the cause of terrorism in Muslims, right? We need to police them all because any of them could be terrorists. And what happens really cleverly when you focus on Muslims like that is that you ignore any context, right? You ignore the fact that this state, this government, funds, arms and supports terrorist organizations and governments which support those organizations. This government occupies and goes to illegitimate war with countries and then expects there to be no antagonism, no, no anger, no, no feelings of um, disrespect. Of course, you know, violence doesn't have to be the answer, but let's ask another question. What happens when you bring up people in a country and say to them, because you're recognized in this category, you are gonna be surveilled, you're gonna be criminalized, you're three times more likely to be unemployed than your peers, you're more likely to grow up in poverty, etc., etc. By not having to kind of deal with any of these socio-economic or political problems, we let off the entire kind of state and we just focus on the figure of the Muslim. Another great example is last week, some of you might have seen um, the headline that was in the Sun 
it was a big scandal, um, the Sun headline, so it was in the context of the conviction of a grooming gang. And the headline said, Pakistani men are raping white girls. So what I thought was really interesting about this headline was that the, the problem of rape and child abuse was placed in Pakistani men. And now, to me, that did a huge disservice to any survivor of sexual assault or violence because it said, we, the British people, cannot comprehend rape and child abuse. It is something so inherent to these other people, these Muslim Pakistani people, that we just blame them for it and we, we don't have to change anything about this society, right? So we don't have to question the justice and legal systems and the fact that victim blaming is a huge part of what they do, that they do not take sexual assault survivors seriously. Um, we do not have to look at the way that children and end up in vulnerable positions, we do not have to question the welfare state, we do not have to question the fact that we raise men in this society with an entitlement to women's bodies, right? All those things go unheeded, unasked, and we simply say, no, rape is a problem of this culture. I think the ultimate one is um, Britishness, right? We all have this joke that like no one can really define Britishness, um, ha ha ha, but I think we do know exactly what Britishness is not, right? What Muslims are is what Britishness is not. So Muslims are violent, therefore Britishness is peaceful, tolerant. Muslims are homophobic and misogynistic, therefore Britishness is being inclusive and tolerant. What's really interesting about this is that it does the exact same thing, right? You displace every socio-economic and political problem onto the Muslim, this, this ghosty figure, and you say, yeah, cool, we're all doing right. Um, you know, Britain's great. But, Britain is endemically a violent society, right? Ask any woman, ask any trans person, ask any queer person, any disabled person, any homeless person, ask anyone who is living below the poverty line, ask anyone on benefits, ask anyone who has been done over by the welfare state, ask anyone who's been hit by austerity. This, this country is violent, right? So by displacing violence all the time onto these others and these figures that are scaring us, we ignore that. Um, this next poem is about that and about, in particular, the phrase, which I'm sure you've seen, British born, so it's British hyphen born, and it's only used to talk about Muslims um, in this country. It's a short poem. Paper says British born, like that's all it is, just an accident. They rubbed out British raised, desperately trying to deflect, erasing the context and connection, the fact that this society made him, this land, this place, our words, our harm, but he's British born, not British. British, <laughs> never British. They pretend the birthplace is somehow random, places motives in a foreign land, must be the fact of his grandparents' birth, must be the fact of his skin. What a welcome from the heart of the empire, Raj of the Raj, a massive thumbs up from the hand which sliced us. I am British born, British passport, but neon hijab and signposted skin. The scanner goes off, obviously. A woman, a woman searches over me and looks straight through me. Random swabs are made, I am unmade. Passport says British, her eyes say British born only. I'm gonna go straight into a second poem which is similar content. <clears throat> the first time my brother comes home from school and uses the word packy, I flinch, gasp. I almost spill the milk. I tell him, no, that is not a word we use to talk about ourselves. What I do not tell him, what hovers in the space between my words, is that that is a word only other people use about us. A word to crush and hurt us, a word to own us, but not be owned by us. The second time my brother comes home from school and uses the word packy, my mother admonishes him, tells him how that word was used to break her bones when she was a child, tells him the neighbours would think he had no respect for himself if they heard him. What hangs in the silence is that that is because packy deserves no respect. That to say it might remind them that our skins are not white and to our ancestors, this was never home. My grandfather pours over a three inch photograph on a phone screen cradled in his muscular autumnal hands. Hands that taught themselves how cotton was spun in Bradford Mills where the lack of light blurred young men's sight. Hands that held 21 grandchildren in a foreign land to give them hopes and dreams on these streets paved with gold and lined with blackened terraced housing. That's not what I looked like when I lived there. The words fall from his mouth, 42 years heavy with the weight of not forgetting home. The third time my brother comes home from school and uses the word packy, I ask him why he is using it pejoratively, why he is synonymizing it with filth and subpar. He says that is the only way he has heard it been used before. 
The fourth time my brother comes home from school and uses the word packy, I smile. I lead him to the kitchen, cut out our tongues, slice them up and sew them back together in new shapes, relearning the language of our grandmother. I stand him in the mirror, show him how to wipe these ivory white apologies from our skins, take him to the garden, tell him to look up high, let the sun work her art on his beautiful face. We spit out sorry and vomit attempts at assimilation all over the grass. For assimilation without acceptance is not that. The rain comes and washes the dust from our hands, a color of pain. And this is what it is to be a Paki. Thanks guys, I'm gonna wrap up now um, and just end on a final poem. Uh, just to say, uh, thank you so much for coming to the information stage. Um, I absolutely don't want you to go home today and think you've learned something about Muslims or Muslim women. You absolutely have not. Maybe you can go home today and reflect on the fact that you might have internalized some assumptions that might be untrue. There might be some narratives that you have accepted as true that might be false. Uh, I'd really appreciate it if you did that. Um, I've been Sahima Manzor Khan. You can find me online at The Brown Hijabi and on Twitter at The Brown Hijabi. This is my final poem. Some poems force you to write them. The way sirens force their way through window panes in the night and you can't shut out the news even when you try. Write a humanizing poem, my pen and paper goad me. Show them how wrong their preconceptions are, be relatable. Write something upbeat for a change, crack a smile. Tell them how you also cry at the end of Toy Story 3 and you're just as capable of bantering about the weather in the post office queue. Like everyone, you have no idea how to cook the perfect amount of pasta still. Feed them stories of stoic humor. Make a reference to childhood. Tell an anecdote about being frugal, mention the X Factor. Be domestic, successful, add layers, tell them you know brown boys who cry about the sides of Assad's, Amir's and Hassan's. They don't know the complex inner worlds of Samayas and Aisha's. Tell them comedies as well as tragedies. How full of life we are, how full of love. But no, I put my pen down. I will not let that poem force me to write it because it's not the poem I want to write. It's the poem I have been reduced to. Reduced to proving my life is human because it is relatable. Valuable because it is recognizable. But good GCSEs, family and childhood memories are not the only things that count as a life. Living is. So this will not be a Muslims are like us poem. I refuse to be respectable. Instead, love us when we're lazy. Love us when we're poor. Love us in our back-to-backs, council estates, depressed, unwashed and weeping. Love us high as kites, unemployed, joyriding, time-wasting, failing at school. Love us filthy, without the right colour passport, without the right sounding English. Love us silent, unapologising, shopping in Poundland, skiving off school, homeless, unsure, sometimes violent. Love us when we aren't athletes. When we don't bake cakes, when we don't offer our homes or free taxi rides after the event, when we're wretched, suicidal, naked and contributing nothing, love us then. Because if you need me to prove my humanity, I'm not the one that's not human. My mother texts me too after BBC News alerts. Are you safe? Let me know you're home okay. And she means safe from the incident, yes, but also from the after effects. So sometimes I wonder, which days of the week my eye count is liberal and which moments of forehead to the ground am I conservative? I wonder, when you buy bombs, is there a clear difference between the deadly ones that kill and the heroic ones which scatter democracy? I wonder, isn't it really guilty until proven innocent? How can we kill in the name of saving lives? How can we illegally detain in the name of maintaining the law? I can't write it. I put my pen away. I can't, I won't write it. Is this radical? Am I radical? Because there is nowhere else left to exist now. Thank you so much, Bristol.